So one thing that stood out to me among others, and Lynn, one of the things that stood out was this comment that your idea of what's possible was above and beyond what anyone else's idea of possibility was. Where do you think you got that from, and how has it served you on this journey? I think it really goes back to my childhood. I was called a tomboy as a little girl, and I thought it was a derogatory term because it made me feel less of a girl, but I didn't see anything wrong with playing outside and climbing trees and even our neighborhood telephone or light pole. Um, I'd never seen a picture of a climber, so I had no idea about climbing. But I think that being marginalized and called a tomboy made me uh, look within and see that that was something that I loved to do and it was natural for me. And so I followed that. And uh, so I had a different perspective. And what was it that first got you interested in climbing? I was lucky to have an older brother and sister that took me climbing for the first time. And it was actually my sister's boyfriend who saw a note in a climbing shop for free, or not, I think he had to pay a little bit for a lesson. But back then it was difficult to get into climbing because it wasn't a known sport. So they started climbing and figuring it out on their own and they took me along because they thought I'd like it and they were right. <laughs> Tommy, you in the video, it says you craved big objectives. Where did that come from? Um, man, I was, I think it started when I was a child. My dad was this kind of crazy larger than life character. He was a school teacher, a mountain guide and a bodybuilder. So he had this very interesting combination of like wanting to nurture me as a child and then also wanting to, he was like pretty macho, so wanting to make me kind of tough. So. Um, he raised me, well, he had this like deep belief that you have to prepare your child for the path. And I, I like to call his parenting technique elective hardship. <laughs> Nadine Harris kind of derailed this theory a little bit yesterday in her speech mm -hmm. with the uh, childhood adversity uh, experience. <laughs> but he exposed me to as much as he could. And um, one story I'll quickly tell is, uh, when I was two and a half years old and still in diapers, he took me deep into the Colorado Rockies, me and my sister, and we were sleeping in a snow cave during this raging blizzard, and it was probably my earliest memory. I remember every few hours he'd have to wake up and um, shovel out the entrance of the cave so that we didn't get trapped. And then he'd wait, when he'd lay back down, he would pull me and my sister in close, and we just had this feeling like it wasn't a scary experience to him. It, like, he, he kind of reframed adversity as adventure in this really pretty amazing way, and that, um, that's really what fueled me to dream big, I guess. So you weren't scared. You, you felt his, whatever he was feeling was part of what you were feeling. Yeah, yeah, like these exciting experiences were our way to suck the marrow out of life, and that is what really added to our lives as opposed to something to be afraid of. Lynn, you are a woman of firsts, and not just first as a woman, but first as a person of any stripe. I'm curious what that means to you, and also in the context of this sport, what that means. So, um, as I mentioned, it was a very young sport. Uh, I've been climbing for 40 years, and um, there weren't very many women in the sport. And I had one role model, and I remember reading in a, a famous book, The Vertical World of Yosemite, that women are conspicuously absent from the pages of this book. I make no apologies here because women simply weren't doing any major first ascents during the formative years of Yosemite. And that really kind of surprised me. And I felt that it was important to have role models. And I already felt like outside of the normal paradigm of what a woman should be. And I also had a lot of experience that was unique as an American climber, period, not man, woman. I was raised in California. I moved to New York, learned different techniques on different types of rock. Then I moved to France and discovered the world of limestone overhanging faces where you're hanging on to your finger pockets on really steep terrain. That taught me how to push myself to the, the max, and I just loved learning and, and exploring, and I think that the vision that I had from all these different travels gave me a different perspective of the nose route, and I, the culture that I was from was um, a traditional style. We climbed that type of, 
uh, roots where you place your own protection in the cracks. So the combination of the sport climbing experiences in Europe and in America gave me the perspective to see the possibilities. And so it was important to me to do that, to show that it wasn't just the domain of men to have vision and to work hard and to be a great climber. It comes from passion and it comes from really believing in yourself and having a different perspective. Tommy, you ran into some trouble in Kyrgyzstan on a climb there. It's completely unexpected. Tell us about it. Yeah, my dad's child raising technique was pretty serendipitous because my first um, major climbing expedition, I turned 21 on this trip, and it was to Kyrgyzstan. And we found ourselves caught in the middle of this war. Um, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan moved into this valley um, to sort of pave this opium trade trail. And we were up climbing on this wall, and they saw us as um, an opportunity to take us hostage. and use us for ransom, so they actually shot up at the wall and we had to come down and then they took us hostage for six days. And this was an <clears throat> incredibly life-defining event. I mean, like a, uh, like a huge experience that really has, I, like I think of my life kind of in terms of everything that led up to that moment and everything since that moment. And um, we were hostage for six days, no food, little water, 11,000 feet, almost no clothing. Um, and to escape at the end, I ended up pushing our head captor off a cliff, and we made a run for it. And um, that experience, I think, had the opportunity to crush me. And, it, and it, it really mixed me up in a lot of ways. But because of the way I've, I was raised, I was able to sort of take some lessons from that um, and apply them to my future life. And mainly, um, six days without food or water in that stressful environment redefined my idea of what I thought a human body could endure, what I thought was humanly possible. And ever since then, I had this kind of deep curiosity about that. And that's really what led me to El Capitan and figuring out how to play out that curiosity on this beautiful canvas of this giant wall. Translate that for us. What does that mean to translate that curiosity on the wall? What, what is that? What is it? What goes through your mind in that moment as you're climbing, and what goes into preparing for something like that? I mean, to a climber, El Cap is kind of El Capitan is kind of the icon. It's the it's one of the most beautiful canvases, the biggest rock wall in North America, and to climb it, it's just like a ton of work, and it's a hugely complicated logistical thing, and it's the kind of thing that people originally thought was impossible. And Lynn was one of the main pioneers of proving everybody wrong, and I kind of took that and why I wanted to stand on the shoulders of giants. And so I went to El Cap and I did the routes that had been previously done, the nose as one of them. I did the second ascent of the route that Lynn did the first ascent of. And then I wanted to take it farther. I got this glimpse of, of something that people thought was impossible and then proving them wrong, wrong. And that was kind of addicting and I wanted more of that. So I started looking at the wall and I was like, okay, some people thought that this route that I did was maybe impossible. I want to find something that maybe everybody thinks is impossible and try and prove them wrong. And so that's how this route, the Don Wall, which is labeled on this photo here, um, came to be. And, and I just thought it was going to be sort of the next climbing objective, and it turned into this um, crazy seven-year odyssey. <laughs> Lynn, you were the first woman to succeed at that ascent of the wall. What kind of preparation went into that? What did you train, and what went through your mind as you were going through it? I would say it took a lifetime of climbing experiences. As I mentioned before, the style of climbing that I grew up learning in California served me well on El Capitan because you follow a, a line of crack systems, and that's where you put your protection. And where it gets difficult, you can see on this photo, um, there aren't very many holds to hang on to. So um, I look at climbing in a very geometric way, and I looked for opposition. So in order to stay in this corner, you have to use opposition on both sides. But it's not just to stay in the corner, but you have to move up. So it's kind of like that game of Twister. You, you have to just coordinate uh, the push-pull forces, and, and it seems kind of awkward, but um, you don't succeed at this sort of thing on your first try. It takes a lot of different efforts and, and different sequences. You try to put your hands and feet in different order and um, just coordinate it like Tai Chi, maybe. So. Um, this climb 
required not as much work as um, you might think. It took three days to figure out this section you're looking at. Um, well, actually, no, you're looking at the Great Roof. So the Great Roof is located about 2,000 feet off the ground. So you have to climb all the way up there to get to this very difficult section. And underneath the roof, it's very thin. You're only hanging on to fingertips. And, and you have your fingers in this crack, and the roof is at your head, so it's awkward. So you have to pull out and push with your feet on the face to get across. And so most people failed at the great roof and the section that you saw before in that corner because they were extremely difficult, and people look at that and say, that's not possible. So just through um, years of experience, flexibility, strength, coordination, and, and having the eye to see the possibilities is what you need. As you're in that moment, is there any self-doubt? Well, climbing is unique also because it's a state of mind, kind of like a moving meditation. And your best performances happen when you're not thinking. You might have distractions that enter your, your state. Um, maybe you'll have an insecure thought. And I've trained myself to keep going. Even if my foot slips, I put it back on. And whatever the fear or fatigue or distraction may be, you just acknowledge it and keep going. Tommy, do you have any special way that you maintain composure in these types of situations? Um, probably a lack of intelligence. <laughs> 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 I don't, I don't know. I think, I think climbers um, that are successful in these big walls, they have a way of simplifying something that, se that seems incredibly complicated and scary to most people. And one of the most beautiful aspects of climbing is the, the flow state that it creates. There's, that's so complicated. There's so many things that have to be done precisely right that it takes all of your brain to make that happen. And it creates the, these very utopic moments that, um, that are that are one of the reasons that we do it, mainly. And now, because of Google Street View and your participation in this, we can actually experience some of this, some of those moments. Why, why participate? Why be a part of that project, Lynn? Oh, it was an amazing opportunity to work with such a professional group of people and, and literally hang out on the wall with my friends. And um, I think for me, when I first came to Yosemite, it was on a family camping trip and you drive through Wawona Tunnel and you see that magnificent view of the valley. And I had never seen a picture of a climber, so I, I didn't understand what people were doing. And I asked the question, do people climb these walls? And the answer was yes. And I couldn't imagine what they were doing. And so for a non-climber, you can see that we're hanging onto the rock. And you can see the positions and you can see the equipment. Um, and the amazing views. So it was a great opportunity also to share the story of climbing because people don't really understand what free climbing is. And by the way, we should just call it rock climbing because <laughs> we're not doing it without a rope. Um, you might not see the rope always, but I'm not crazy. I don't want to die. So I use rope and protection in case I fall. But free climbing refers to the style of using the natural features of the rock to climb up instead of hanging on the rope or using your equipment to get up. Tommy, what drew you to the project? Um, well, climbing, I mean, so the Donwall was this project um, that, like I said before, was this seven-year odyssey. And really, rock climbing has been a pretty obscure sport. Um, from the beginning. When my dad was taking me out climbing, most people thought he was kind of a lunatic for taking his kids up on these rocks. And it's really taken this big shift in, in the most recent years. It's becoming pretty popular. And I think my experience on the Don Wall sort of showed that. Um, I'd been, me and my pot climbing partner, Kevin, worked on this route for seven years. Not too many people really knew about it, just our sort of close-knit climbing community. And then something kind of crazy happened when we went for a final 19-day push this last January. Um, I was just using my smartphone to update my Instagram account, mostly to let my mom know that I was okay up there. My <laughs> poor mom has dealt with a lot in my life. And what that did is it put it out there to the world to kind of get a glimpse of this environment of big walls in a way that I didn't pr predict or plan at all. But 
people, I started to use Instagram and Twitter as kind of like my personal journal, and I would post a photo every day, and I would tell a little bit about what was going on up there, and people started take, taking notice. Um, this gentleman by the name of John Branch from the New York Times uh, wrote an article that was picked for the cover of the newspaper, and it gained so much attention that they decided to continue to put updates about our progress on this climb on the cover of the New York Times, and it went viral in this incredible way. This obscure sport of rock climbing was suddenly being viewed by millions of people, I think like 13 billion media impressions worldwide. It put it on display almost like a football game or something like that, that everybody could tune in and watch, but that lasted for 19 days. And so, um, and then I had this really crazy experience just a few days after the climb where we topped out to all this crazy media. It was kind of awkward in a lot of ways, but we came down and we were sitting in, me and my partner, Kevin, were sitting in the lodge, um, the lobby of Yosemite Lodge when this older woman spotted us from across the room and she had a walker and she saw us and she started to kind of shuffle her way over towards us. And when she got up close to us, you could see that she was kind of like crying there, tears running down her cheeks. And she looked up and she's like, I just want to let you guys know that my doctor told me in a few months I'm going to be in a wheelchair because of my MS. And I saw you guys up there, and I decided I'm not going into a wheelchair. I'm going to make this my Don Wall. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, what, what has happened here? Like, older women on walkers were not the demographic I really thought would be <laughs> inspired by climbing. And um, I started to realize the power of this modern storytelling. And I wanted to take this environment of big wall climbing and, and use it to inspire people. And it just so happened that Google was in the process of trying to do this vertical street view thing, and I jumped on board. I wanted to be a part of this because it was a way to show people who don't have access to this world to show them what it's like up there. There's a lot, Lynn, that goes into showing people who don't have access to this world. Take us behind the scenes of the actual capturing of the footage and what goes into that. Well, you can see this tripod at the, uh, well, this camera at the end of the tripod, and it was set up on this uh, circular system so that you could take a picture in all the different directions. So as the climber, um, in the photos that you saw, we would pick a location that was iconic along the route, like the Great Roof was, you can see that from the ground, it's way up there, it looks really small. But when you see the picture, um, you can navigate all around in every direction. You can look up the wall, you can look down, you can look at every little detail that you want. So for the climber, we had to just stay in that position. Once they got that shot, they took the shots all around. They had to take the tripod off, take a picture straight in. So there were 10 different directions, and uh, that's how they put it all together. And it was pretty exciting, because the first picture that they took was, um, they, they had somebody up there with a the, uh, laptop, and they stitched it together, and, and we could see it like an hour after we took the picture. It was amazing. Along this multi-decade climbing career that will continue on for many more decades to come, what, Lynn, has been the most difficult lesson you've had to learn? Hmm. That's a tough one. Um, well, you know, like... At the, yesterday, listening to the speakers um, talking about things like racism and me being the woman, you know, who's who is trying to be an example for other women because I didn't have that many role models, and and now there's actually a, a lot of women climbers. But I think that um, one of the points that was made yesterday is that it's not done, it's not over. We have a lot of subconscious stereotypes, all of us do, um, and. It's, it's something that we have to change by the way that we live and, and the way that we think and the way that we associate with women and men in different roles. And so I think the hardest thing is to realize that you can make a lot of effort and, it's, and that the path is, is still long in front of you. There's still a long way to go. There's still a big mountain ahead. There's always a new climb. And, and that's what makes climbing really the best sport in the world for me because it's a pretext to travel and it's always different. Even if you do the same climb, it's a different experience. And so you have to be adaptable and flexible in um, the way that you move and, and the way that you take care of yourself. And I think that for me, it's 
help me have a, a youthful spirit because I think what Tommy said before about curiosity, um, if you're not curious, you're not asking questions and you're not challenging yourself and, and you got to keep doing that. So the, it's, it's never really, you're never really at the top. You, you might be there temporarily, but there's, there's always new challenges. Tommy, what would you, of all the things that you've taken along the way, what would you tell that childhood self of yours? What lesson would you share with that childhood self of yours? Uh, check the State Department website before going on vacation. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I, mean, I, I feel like I was incredibly blessed to be raised in the way I was. And I want to, I mean, I think my parents, in a lot of ways, they did it right. Like, they made me maybe a little bit reckless at times. Um, and so I would. You know, with my child, I'm I'm gonna try and maybe make minor minor corrections, but um, <laughs> for the most part, it was great, and it's 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 what I want to pass on to my my child as well. So this life of adventure and really not living through fear, I think that's really one of the huge parts. Like when you have a dream and you can ad identify it, shut off that frontal cortex and just go for it. You know, that's really the most fulfilling way to go. I'm curious to know from both of you, and we can start with you, Lynn, what that next big climb is. In, in your dream scenario, what's the next big one that's going to break new records? Well, this is maybe not going to sound that interesting because um, after climbing all around the world and having all these experiences, um, I have a child who's 12 now, and uh, I want to have some stability for him, so I want to discover my own backyard, and I picked a place that is beautiful. I live in Boulder, Colorado, and there's a lot of different climbing all around, a really good community. So um, I want to continue to test myself on new routes in my own backyard. Is it difficult being as successful as you have been with a child now to not give him all of the answers, to allow him to find some of the answers on his own? I think about... I'm envisioning myself golfing with my dad, who isn't a great golfer, but he used to tell me what to do. He would tell me how to swing. And I think that must be tough to be in the position you're in and not give too much guidance. Well, my son actually is pretty stubborn. So <laughs> he doesn't listen to any advice that I give him about climbing or anything like that. In fact, I don't push climbing on him at all. I think it's important for each person to choose their path. And, um, I think that this generation is a little bit softer than our generation and the way our parents raised us. Mm -hmm. I was one of seven, so we learned to fend for ourselves. And one of the family sayings was, you snooze, you lose. So um, I only have one child, and it's a way different dynamic. And I feel like it's more expected in today's society to manage your child's schoolwork and everything else. And it's like, wow, this is really a lot different. And so my fear is that he's not going to have some of the skills that I was raised to learn. I mean, I, I learned it because I had to, and he doesn't have to. So if anything, I'm, I'm worried that it's going to be too easy for him. <laughs> That's really interesting. Do you have that fear at all, Tommy? That it's going to be too easy? Um, I, I don't really, I mean, I don't think of it in terms of that. I think that, uh, but my child's only one and a half, so what, <laughs> what do I know at this point? I guess too easy is not exactly what I meant, but, um, because uh, life is not easy for anyone, no matter what your situation is. But um, I, I think that there's more expected as a parent, and, and they are not required to do as much, at least from my perspective. What's been the biggest surprise along this journey outside of maybe what happened to you when you were 21, but Tommy, what's been the biggest surprise along this journey of climbing? Um, I think the, my biggest surprise has been the way that people have connected with this thing that seemed incredibly obscure to me for a long time. Like, I liked the fact that I was part of this, like, small group of people who I felt like we had unlocked this secret to sort of like adventure and excitement and human bliss in this world of rock climbing. Um, but I didn't think that, I just thought we were weird, kind of, and that I thought that. And then when everybody else started, when the light bulb started going off in other people's heads, that, that really surprised me. Lynn? 
Well, I guess just the, I've been climbing for so long that from where I started and where it is now, it's a completely different thing. There were no climbing walls, um, artificial climbing walls, and now there's like around 500 in this country. You can go to any major city and, and go to a climbing wall. And so the accessibility and the popularity of it has surprised me somewhat. Um, but on the other hand, I love climbing, and I think it's great. I think it's a great activity for kids and, and people of all ages, actually. And obviously, for little girls, it's great because it teaches them confidence and it's empowering. And um, it's not something that requires any uh, team or anything. It's, it's, it, it requires partnership and, and your belay or the person that holds the rope, and that's a nice camaraderie. But when you're up there on the rock, it's you and you can't blame anybody or make any excuses. Um, it's all about that personal lesson, and it's a way of checking in with yourself and seeing how well you're doing with the challenges. Do you panic? Do you, uh, you know, lose it? Do you shake? Do you, or do you go into a different state of just acceptance and adapting to that situation? So I think it's great that climbing has grown. The only negative side of that is that now when you go to the famous climbing areas, people always want to go to the famous routes, mm -hmm. and if you go to the Nose route, um, that's, that was first done in 1958, and it was the most historic route in Yosemite, and probably the biggest, or probably the most famous big wall in the world. So when you go there, um, there's issues to deal with as far as lines, and then you know, the management of the parks, the human waste and all of the other things that are behind the scenes. They're, they're the trade-offs of this becoming as popular as it has become and as, and as much attention being on it. One thing that I'm sure neither of you could have fully envisioned at the time was the ability to see your entire route through Street View, which we have a video of where we can literally see the entire thing. Yeah, this was pretty cool because uh, we had to sort of take the, this camera thing that Google had made and, min and make it way smaller. I mean, I think the normal thing they drive around in the car is like 35 pounds, the Trekker. And so we had to, um, in the middle of the Dawnwall climb, uh, we brought up all of these camera equipment, start playing with it and swinging around and figuring out how to, do, how to tell this vertical story uh, or tell this world of El Cap, this story of this world of El Cap in this vertical environment. And that was... Um, and really cool for me. I think I have a little bit of a mind of an engineer, and that clued me into it. So, great. Great. Thank you so much, Lynn and Tommy. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.